Good morning. Welcome to the Michigan Court of Appeals. Uh, we are the appellate panel set to hear cases for the April 2024 Detroit case call. Uh, my name is Brock Swartzel, and as indicated, um, joining me today in the courtroom is Judge Garrett. Uh, Judge Servito is also a member of the panel, and we've been talking and communicating regularly to prepare for this case call. As you can see, however, Judge Servito will be participating remotely today. Under Judicial Policy 1.2.2, when a judge is not present when argument is to begin, that judge can participate in deciding the case as submitted to the panel by viewing the oral argument and then conferring with the other judges. Um, that's what we plan to do today. If an, er if an attorney takes issue with this approach, I'd ask that you let us know now. Seeing no objections, we will proceed as I have outlined. Be assured that we read all your briefs and that we are well acquainted with each of your cases. Please do not rehash the facts or the claims that you've made in your brief in full. Instead, oral argument is the opportunity to tell us succinctly why you believe you should prevail on appeal. And please advise the panel of any new case law or statutory law since uh, the briefs were submitted. Um, most importantly, oral argument is the opportunity for the panel to ask questions and for you to hopefully be able to answer those questions. Uh, finally, be sure that you do not use the names of minors or victims of sexual assault or domestic violence because today's proceedings will be or are being recorded and will be posted to YouTube. So with that said, we will get going. I'll call the first case for today. Uh, it's the number nine on our docket, docket number 363452 or the USA Underwriters. Morning. Good morning. Do we have anybody here for the appellant? Have we heard from Mr. Payne? Nobody's checked in. I do not have an indication of any waiver. It is 10.05. This case call begins at 10 a.m. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, if, you, if you have time, I'm going to, we'll go to number 10. And then after 10, we'll recall number nine. And if Mr. Payne is not here by then, then we'll just submit it. Is that okay? Thank you. So that's what we'll do. Uh, we're gonna move on to number 10, docket number 364360, estate of Nicole Ray Kenworthy, v. Mish. If I forget, I'm gonna go back to nine. Oh, well. <laughs> Morning, Your Honors. Good morning. Peter Angelus, I represent the appellant. Please proceed. Your Honors, may it please the court. This appeal merely seeks to reaffirm the basic tenets of tort law that under certain circumstances, one has a duty towards another to act when a peril is apparent. The appellant in this case is not seeking to expand existing tort law, amplify it, abrogate it, simply just trying to reaffirm what the longstanding tort law has been in our state. Tort law as its basic tenet is a process by which one knows how to, is, is being guided on how to um, conduct himself or herself towards others where certain circumstances arise. The number one thing tort law does is to try to guide our behaviors towards others to whom we have a relationship with or a duty with. Um, and then also to provide a civil process by which we can remediate a breach of that duty where injuries occur and there's proximate cause. The elements of, of uh, tort law is obvious and it's been 
well established is notice foreseeability creates a legal duty. There has to be a breach of that duty, proximate cause between the damages and we're, so on. We're, we're, and you're aware of that. Yes. I realize that. So on a cold night in April of 2020, the very married 52 year old defendant Jody Mish invites a 32 year old young lady, Nicole Kenworthy, to a remote property which he solely possessed. Um, he possessed it by virtue of the fact that his father had permitted him to place a trailer on that property. Now, talking about possession, I think the trial court disagreed with you. Can you explain why sure. the trial court was wrong with regard yes, to possession? I can, because he was the only adult on the property that had the legal right to be there. There was 50 acres. He had uh, plate his, placed his fifth wheel on the property and no one else was on the, on the property but himself and his two minor children. Um, you don't have to be the owner of a property to be a possessor of a property. And a possessor is just as liable and has just as many duties towards an invitee as, as Nicole was, um, as somebody that uh, owns the property. It depends. That really, possession is the thing that we have to consider in terms of a premises liability case. Um, and under these circumstances, all we know about what happened that evening comes from the very extensive police interview that we've submitted. We did submit to the trial court and also submitted it to the Court of Appeals. We know that um, the defendant knew that Nicole was troubled, that she uh, had they had run into each other a few days before, and that he offered to bring her out to the property to either counsel her or provide her some comfort. Um, she gets dropped off at the residence at this it's not even a residence, a remote campsite in the middle of nowhere, has no way to get home, no phone. He last saw Nicole standing in, in the swamp on his property and he did absolutely nothing. Right, and, but I, I, I mean, I wanna make clear, the trial court, if I recall correctly, the trial court made essentially two findings or two rulings. Correct. One, that this was premises liability, not ordinary negligence. So that's one issue. And then secondly, that um, there was no possession or control. And, but in terms of getting into, was there a duty and was the duty breached? If I recall correctly, trial court didn't get into that at all. It, it did. The, the trial court addressed both the negligence and premises liability. The trial court dismissed any duty because he, the trial court originally determined at page two, quote, there are no facts to show that Kenworthy needed assistance, only that she was standing in water. The trial court chose to disregard the fact that she was standing in water in a dark remote area on 50 acres of property where there was no other adults on the property. She was distraught. She was wearing thinly, uh, thin clothes. There's no way out of the property, no one else around, and just chose one fact, one fact. And these facts are controverted. Whether there was a peril to Nicole is a question of fact that the jury should have been able to determine. Usually there, the issue of duty is something that is a question of law, but sometimes a trier of fact is required to determine whether the facts create a duty. So under these circumstances, there were questions of fact. At the trial court level on the summary disposition motion, it's not my duty, it's not the, the adverse party's duty to um, produce enough to persuade the trier of fact. We just have to show at, at that level that there was a question of fact whether a duty existed. And a duty exists first and foremost where there's foreseeability of peril. The trial court absolutely dismissed the foreseeability argument right off the bat. You can't have a duty without foreseeability. That's the first element of, of a, a tort. Quote, there are no facts to show that Kenworthy needed assistance, only that she was standing in water. That was the opinion of the trial court at page two. Didn't talk about the remoteness, the thickness of the area where she was stuck, the fact that he knew that there was standing water there, the fact that it was 33 degrees and she had no way to get home. She was walking in the wrong direction. He knew all that and chose to, to uh, go back to sleep. The estate's complaint pled theories of negligence and premises liability. Under these circumstances, they're not mutually exclusive. The negligence claim is premised upon two things. The fact that he took on the task of trying to console and, and uh, counsel Nicole because he had a prior life as a youth counselor. He had a spiritual background. Uh, uh, Nicole knew that he was spiritual. So he accepts the student to bring her out there purportedly to read scripture to her. All right. Something he did didn't work out too well because within minutes after reading the scripture, he was being called the devil, 
quote unquote, don't touch me, quote unquote. She was, quote, kind of frantic, close unquote. So what happened during this counseling session? Was he, in, and did he have a duty? Did that create a duty, the counseling session, the fact that he invited her out there? Did he have a duty because she was a social guest? He was a social host and she was a licensee on the property. Did he have a duty towards her because there was a special relationship by virtue of a three or four year relationship where there's very intimate texts back and forth that we've shared with this court? Was there a duty because they had an intimate sexual relationship for years? Was there a duty by the fact that he knew she had no way out of that property? These all create a legal duty. Certainly the foreseeability is there, the duty is there. Now, generally, in this case, the question I think the trial court analyzed was, is there a duty of care or a duty to rescue somebody? And generally, there is no duty to rescue somebody when that person is in peril, absent a specific relationship. But the trial court imposed, and this is the second element that I think the trial court got wrong. The first is finding no, no foreseeability of peril. And again, I'm focusing on the negligence claim. How could there be no foreseeability of peril under these circumstances? She had never been to this property. It's pitch black at night. It's 33 degrees. Secondly, the trial court imposes a very onerous and misguided burden that, quote, but special relationships only exist where a party entrusts herself to the protection and control of another. And in doing so, that party loses the ability to protect herself. That was the judge's ruling, the trial court's ruling, citing only one case, Downs versus Saperstein, 265 Mishap, 696 at 701. That is not Michigan's law. That's not Michigan's tort law. Michigan's tort law does not require a finding that a person have to, has to entrust oneself to another and thereby lose the control and ability to protect oneself. There are many circumstances where one has a duty towards another, uh, where there is no such um, giving up of control. A business owner has a duty towards a business invitee. That business invitee, the customer hasn't given up his control or her control to the business owner. A driver has a duty towards a pedestrian. Uh, a tree cutter has a duty not to drop a limb on a passerby, and a friend has a duty to another friend when a peril arises. Under none of these circumstances is it required in our body of jurisprudence going back 50 years, and we probably could go back even more than 50 years, where there's this owner's burden that was imposed upon my client that a special relationship, quote, only exists where a party entrusts herself to the protection and control of another. That's not the law. Um, the special relationship in this case is premised upon what I've already talked about the three or four year relationship, the intimate conversations back and forth, the fact that he chose to offer her counseling and comfort, the fact that he invited her to that property, possibly the fact that he was a business inviter and invited her to that property for a transactional purpose. And I referenced that only to show that there was a relationship between the parties. Um, and then let's look at the Downs case. The Downs case was the only case relied upon by the trial court. And, it, and in that case, first addressed governmental immunity. Secondly, the case addressed duties uh, created by a statute and only finally considered whether the fire chief, who was a defendant in that case, owed a duty to the decedents, to the estates in that case, where the fire chief never worked the fire, never made any decisions about the fatal fire, never spoke with the decedents, and the decedents never had any relationship with him. That's not our case. These two people were not strangers in the night. It's not a situation where I see somebody down there in peril. I have no relationship with that person. It's more like the situation where I invite my friends on my boat over the summer and one is in peril in the water. Are you saying I don't have a duty to throw that person a life jacket? I don't have a duty to call somebody. I can just watch my friend drown in the water. That's what this trial court said. And I, I strongly believe that's not what our jurisprudence is in this case. Rather, I believe that our Michigan jurisprudence holds simply that, quote, the relationship between the actor and the injured person gives rise to legal obligation on the part of, on the part of the actor's part for the benefits of the injured party. Moaning versus Alfano, dating back to 1977, talks about, again, just the relationship, just the relationship not about whether one person entrusted to the other person. Moaning was just most recently affirmed by our, our Supreme Court in 2022 in the case of Roland versus Independence Village of Oxford. Quote, a special relationship creates a common law duty of care. These rulings do not 
impose the requirement that an injured party has to entrust oneself and give oneself up to the care of, of another person. That's simply not part of the, of the law, and this Downs case is, is an anomaly. The factors to consider were carefully discussed in Rowland, and again, this is just a recent Michigan Supreme Court decision, which gives us an idea of, of what they're thinking. The factors to consider are foreseeability of harm, all right? The trial court dismissed the foreseeability of harm. How could you not foresee uh, that a harm could occur to a young lady, 30 years old, stuck in the woods, standing water, thinly dressed, no phone, no car, going the wrong direction? The degree of certainty of injury, clearly, again, there there was a degree that she could be injured. The connection between the conduct and the injury, in other words, proximate cause, moral blame attached to this conduct. Of course, his moral blame was, it's repugnant, his, his conduct. Uh, the burdens and consequences of imposing a duty and the resulting liability for breach is one of the final factors. What burden did this, what burden are we trying to impose upon the defendant? Pick up the phone? keep your eyes on her until somebody shows there. That's the only burden. He didn't have to place himself into danger. Um, there is no heavy burden on, the, on this defendant to act. We presented sufficient facts at the trial court to controvert each one of these issues that was just discussed, each one of these factors discussed in, in the Roland decision from 2022. Um, and again, in 2004, Dyer versus Trackman, which talked about rationales dating back to 1992 in other cases, Buskowski versus May, that in determining a duty, we look at the relationship between the parties, the foreseeability of harm, the burden on the defendant, the, and the risk presented. This uh, dire case from 2004 also cited Prosser, fifth edition, a duty arises um, if, uh, if there is an existence of a relationship between the parties, such of such a character that creates a legal duty to act and the imposition of the duty is not uh, undue. Um, and one of our strongest cases is Farwell versus Keaton. The Farwell versus Keaton course 396, Farwell versus Keaton case 396, Mish 281, first of all, is controlling law in the state. Contrary to the assertion of the defendant, it was a plurality decision. Four justices considered the, the uh, Farwell case, three justices, Justice Levin signed the opinion and two concurred, Justice Kavanaugh and Williams. A Supreme Court decision is controlling if it is decided, if it is a decision of a majority of the justices who were sitting on the case, Negri, N-E-G-R-I versus Slotkin, 397 Mish, 105, 110, a 1976 case. The Farwell decision is controlling law. Not only is it controlling law in this case, it's factually exactly identical to this case. In the Farwell decision case, Farwell and Segrest were out as social friends. They went out on the evening. Apparently they interacted with some ladies and there was a fight that ensued. Farwell got beat up. Segrest decides to bring him back to his grandparents' driveway and leaves Farwell in the car of the driveway unconscious, whereupon he was found the next day and later died. Farwell and Sequis were companions on a social venture, and the court determined that implicit in such a common undertaking is the understanding that one will render assistance to the other when he is in peril, if he can do so without endangering himself. That's a direct quote from the Farwell case. The court reasoned in that case that Segrist knew that his friend was in peril, knew that his friend had been badly beaten up, and the court determined that, quote, under these circumstances, to say that Segrist had no duty to obtain medical assistance or at least notify someone of Farwell's condition and whereabouts would be shocking to humanitarian considerations and fly in the face of the commonly accepted code of social conduct, end quote. That's the case that we're presented with today. The conduct of this defendant was reprehensible. I don't believe that our Michigan jurisprudence in terms of negligence law permits that two individuals with such a relationship as were presented in this case can ignore each other when one of them is in peril. Um, when someone is in peril and you are, have that special relationship as we've established, or at least created a question of fact that there was a special relationship, an actor must take action to assist the person that is in peril. Again, Farrell and the cases that I've cited do not impose a duty, I'm sorry, do not impose a requirement 
that the injured party give oneself up to the care of the uh, defendant in a case. That's just simply, again, an anomaly from that one case under facts were, which were completely different than our case. The, the Downs case involved the fire chief that had nothing to do with the decedents. Um, now, moving next to premises liability, um, the judge granted premises liability solely on the open and obvious um, case. And as we know that since our briefing in July of 2023, in the case of Kendall versus El Syed versus F&E Oil, 512 Mish 95, we know that the open and obvious defense has been abrogated. It's been modified. The open and obvious issue is no longer a complete bar. We, first of all, contested that the, the dangerous condition was open and obvious. It was dark. The client, the decedent had never been there. There were no warning signs. So, but aside from that fact, whether the open and obvious constitutes more than 50% comparative is a question of fact for the jury to consider under the El Syed decision. The open and obvious issue is no longer uh, a complete bar to the claim. And in terms of uh, premises liability, in terms of possession, again, I, I don't even see the basis for that. He had legal possession. The defendant had legal possession of the property where he had put a fifth wheel camper. There's a photograph of it in our brief. Big fifth wheel camper at a campsite. He was the only one on the property and he was on the property with the legal permission of the owner, his father. At one point he told the police that he owned the property. So he had possession. You know, a, land, a tenant that has a business is not an owner of the property. He's in possession of his demise premises. That's sufficient. Where you possess or control a property, you have certain obligations to people that you invite. She was, Nicole was either a licensee on the property as a social guest, or she was a business invitee, one way or the other, he had a duty towards her um, in terms of making sure that that property was safe for its intended uh, purpose. Um, and under that circumstance, at, at a minimum, because of the fact that uh, the open obvious was abrogated, that ruling is now defective. Um, and I don't believe that these two causes of action are mutually exclusive. I believe that the jury, we can argue in the alternative, that it was either negligence, the negligence is based upon a couple things. He undertook the counseling and comfort. I think we understand that. Um, did you, Mr. Angelis, did you want to reserve some time? I'll reserve rebuttal? the balance of my time. And the second uh, negligence is just a failure of duty of care when he saw her in peril. The premises is based upon the condition of the property. The negligence is based upon his conduct. So I would reserve the balance of my time. Thank, Thank you. you. Time for rebuttal. Mr. Nichols. Good morning, Your Honors. Matthew Nichols on behalf of the defendant appellee. May it please the court. It's good to see you. Good to see you. It's good to be here today. Um, the lower court's ruling can be affirmed for two main reasons. But before I go into that, I want to address some comments from Brother Counsel, which I, I think Brother Counsel was uh, bringing in some, some facts and allegations in this case that really don't go to the heart of the legal issue before the court as to uh, the, the lower court's ruling that, as to a duty in this premises liability case. It appears that uh, Brother Counsel's focus on certain facts were an attempt to inflame the passions of the panel or the court uh, rather than focusing on the, the legal issues at hand. Now, and, and make this case about morality rather than the specific facts and the law that the court should focus on. Now, plaintiff suggested that defendant in this case didn't do anything, didn't do anything to help Ms. Kenworthy, didn't do anything to prevent this situation. That is simply not the case. And that's not supported by the record, which shows several things. One, that defendant told Ms. Kenworthy to call her friend, Scott, who drove her to the property to come pick her up and take her home. He told Ms. Kenworthy, again, that there was nowhere else to go on the property. So the are, are you getting these from the statement that your client gave to the police? Yes, Your Honor. I, when I was reading through that, I questioned whether you can even do that because that's hearsay. And I know your client was deposed, but, or, or attempted to be deposed, but took the Fifth Amendment, which is certainly his right. But I don't see how your offensive use of that statement would be permitted under the rules of evidence. I understand where plaintiff can use it because if it's being used against 
uh, an opposing party, it's not hearsay. But for you to you for you for you to use it to bolster your client's position without having without being willing to be open to uh, being deposed, I, I don't see how you can use any of that. Well, it, and I and I get it wasn't brief, so I don't want to belabor the point. I'm just pointing it out that I don't see how how you I don't see how you get to use it to undermine the other side's case. Um, I mean, cause then who would ever be deposed? You know, you give a statement and you say, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not willing to sit for deposition. Understood your honor. I think the purpose of bringing these up today is in response to, uh, brother counsel's statements that I think were made to inflame passions of the, of the court, um, which again, although contrary to defendant's statement to the police, and I understand your honor's position with respect to the evidentiary um, value of, of that. Um, but for purposes of today, I'm simply making the point that the defendant did not just stand there and, and push or coax the uh, Ms. Kenworthy out. There were, you know, he claimed that there was nothing done and that's just simply not true. Um, there's also text messages uh, that that go into that a little bit, but your honor, with with regard to the you know the the interview from the uh, Michigan State Police, which was extensive, I, mean, I think that shows that they were looking into this situation from a, a criminal standpoint, and nothing was pursued. There was no um, determination that charges were to be brought against the defendant in this case, but you know. Departing from from the factual issues, Judge, the lower court's ruling can can be affirmed for simply two reasons, and I'll try to boil it down and simplify things without belaboring any points raised in the briefs. But uh, the first is with respect to plaintiff's premises liability claim. Of course, uh, that claim is conditioned upon the presence of a possession and control of the property. You need both to establish a duty. Possession being the right under which one may exercise control over something or property with the caveat to the exclusion of others and control as the exercise of restraint or direction over to dominate, regulate, or command. Again, you need both. Here, the record showed that defendant was not the owner of the property. Plaintiff admits that. His father was the owner, but plaintiff says, well, defendant set up a, a, a camper on the property. So by his act of just setting up a camper on a 50 acre parcel of land, he now becomes the sole possessor and controller of that property. Yet, I don't know what authority exists that says that specific act of just setting up a camper constitutes both possession and control of the property to the exclusion of others. With respect to that caveat, to the exclusion of others and, and control, there was no evidence to support that. There was no evidence to show that the defendant restricted others from the property. He told, it, well, again, in, in his statement with the, the authorities that he doesn't know who's on that property at night. It's a large, 50 acres is a large parcel of property. There's no gate um, like I have in my, in my house that gates my little half acre lot. Did he give did he give consent to the police to search the property? I believe so, Judge. I think there's on, extensive on what basis. Did he do that if he was not in possession of control? I'm sorry. On what basis did he give that right or that um, authority, that permission to search if he was not a possessor and controller of the property? I mean, on the basis of the uh, Miss Kenworthy was at the property the night prior. He texted her several times within about a five minute span. My that, point is if, if your defendant didn't think that he possessed or controlled that property and the police said, may we search not just the trailer, but may, can we search, you know, the 50 acres or at least, you know, the few acres around uh, in proximity, why didn't he respond? This isn't my property. I can't, I don't have that authority to give you. Well, judge, I, I don't, With the father being the 
the owner of the property. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting, but I think his, it wasn't his intent or allowing the authorities to, to search the property as an example of, I have full authority and control over this more so than trying to find Miss Kenworthy or that she's been, she's missing. You might be right, but doesn't that at least create a question of fact? I don't, I don't think so judge because I don't think the record showed that the, the police specifically asked, are you the property owner? Are you, are, are we well, sure I, that I, they probably we, just asked, you know, can we, can we search the right. property? And if your client the, said, sure, or yes. And I'm just saying, you know, if he, if he didn't believe, if he said, if he thought, nope, my dad owns this, I got my trailer, I'm here by permission. Like if I, if I went to a KOA for a weekend in a trailer and somebody came up and said, can we search the KOA property? I'd be like, I don't own this property. I, I can't give you that authority. I, you can search my trailer. So I'm just wondering well, and again, you might be right, and I get it's a father-son issue, but doesn't it at least raise the question of fact of whether he had, you know, through his father, the authority, the possession to, and the control of that property? I don't, I don't think so, Your Honor. I think it, it, it goes to a, a non-issue in the case, really. If we're look at, looking at that, we're kind of veering off the path of, of uh, the premises liability claim and negligence and getting into the realm of constitutional issues with the authority of police to execute searches of, of property. So I don't think it's outcome determinative in this case, judge. Uh, moving on to the, to the ordinary negligence claim. I think the, the lower court's decision can be affirmed simply based on the fact that plaintiff's claims all sounded in, in premises. Um, even though the, the lower court went into to address the ordinary negligence claim um, it, independently. But as the danger was the swamp. Right, Judge. Okay. But but here we get into this plaintiff's claim of, of there was a special relationship, which I, I think really that was kind of a throw, let's throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. They first suggest that Miss Kenworthy was an, an invitee based on you know, for lack of a better word, was um, a prostitution theory that they and they go to attack the defendant's character and his history of um, hiring prostitutes. But that, but at best, that is purely speculative and and not supported by the record of text messages, not not the police report. So, although there was some evidence of a sexual relationship between the uh, Miss Kenworthy and the defendant. The text messages make it clear that the purpose of her visit was just to talk. They, uh, Ms. Kenworthy made it clear that her visit there was for non-sexual purposes, and there was absolutely no evidence in, in, to support this uh, money in, ex in exchange for sexual relations. Next, the, the plaintiff kind of goes into the depth or the scope of Ms. Kenworthy and the defendant's relationship and, and brings in factors from the defendant's past about him being a, a youth pastor. But likewise, there's no evidence that defendant's past as a youth pastor had any involvement with his relationship with Ms. Kenworthy or that he counseled her in a, a professional or even quasi-professional setting. Um, prior, prior to the accident, he, he was reading scripture from the fire pit, but just reading scripture alone does not trigger a special relationship, putting the defendant as, as the, the decedent's pastor. And that, that really wasn't argued or alleged, but they use that as an example to say, look, there was more than just uh, a friendship or um, the relationship between Ms. Kenworthy and the defendant that would trigger uh, a heightened duty or um, convert her status on the property of a social guest, which is a licensee to a, an invitee, which they argue is she was on a, a business invitee as though there was some exchange of money for services. But um, with 
with respect to the uh, going back to control and uh, possession and control of the property, there's there's no evidence to show that Miss Kenworthy relinquished her uh, control of herself over to the defendant, which must be evidence as part of some special relationship. Now she plaintiff acknowledges that after they were sitting by the fire for a few minutes reading scripture, she got up. They they got into an argument. She started calling the defendant the devil. Um, notably, she has a past, and the, the uh, autopsy report showed that she had uh, noticeable amounts of methamphetamine, fentanyl, and I believe cocaine in her system, for whatever that's worth. I'm not going to disparage the, the uh, Miss Kenworthy for that alone. But well, and I'm not saying that both sides have done this. We we seem to be rehashing a lot of what's already in the brief. I mean, and I I don't know that we need to do that. Just explain you know from your brief why you win i guess is the way i would put it yep judge i i think i've gone over the main points on that um i think for the rest i'll just rely on uh, our briefing in okay. the case and we of course request that the this court affirm the trial court's grant of defendant's motion for summary disposition okay thank you thank, thank you, you your honor you have two minutes for rebuttal your honors the passion of this court should be inflamed. They should be inflamed. That's not why you should rule in our favor and reverse the trial court. I'm asking this court, do we want to abrogate our common law that imposes a duty upon one who sees somebody in peril and has a special relationship with that individual? Do we want to impose the owner's burden that a special relationship can only exist where one person entrusts oneself to the protection or control of another? That's a very narrow interpretation of our case law and is premised upon a case that has facts that are completely in opposite to our case. And in this case, in responding to the summary disposition, we didn't have the burden of persuading the trier of fact and winning our whole case. We had a burden of production of creating questions of fact as to whether a duty existed based upon the factors that we've talked about. And there's a lot that we didn't get to talk about because the defendant pled the fifth throughout the deposition that those charges uh, have not been pursued. So the defense is going to have to testify. The jury should have been permitted to decide whether there was foreseeability. The judge made a mistake by saying there's no foreseeability. He said that she was not in peril based upon the sole fact that she was standing in water, disregarded all the other factors that she was distraught, uh, and then said there was no special relationship. Um, and, and finding no special relationship again, disregarded the, the long-term relationship that we provided, and then also made the conclusion that there was absolutely no breach of that uh, duty. And the duty could be more than one thing. The duty was, he took on a, a responsibility of providing counseling. We don't know, he obviously didn't do a very good job of it. And secondly, he had a duty of care once she was in peril. And for that reason, we'd ask that the, the decision be reversed. Thank you, your honors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate the arguments. Uh, the arguments and briefs were very well done, and that helps us get to a resolution, and we expect to issue an opinion within the next couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you. That case is submitted. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, what's listed as number nine on our docket, docket number 363452, uh, Kimberly Orr, the USA Underwriters. I don't know if um, Mr. Payne has had an opportunity to, and have we heard from Mr. Payne? Okay, do you wanna come on up and put your name on? Uh, John from Fresh Hour on behalf of Defendant Apali USA Underwriters. Um, this is a uh, case that arises out of lower court's rescission of an insurance contract uh, based on material misrepresentations made in the application. It's our position that the court did not err and that actually there were multiple bases to affirm. I think all of the issues have been adequately briefed. So I'm happy to rest on our briefs unless your honors have any. Um, I just had one questions. question. Yeah. Um, does it matter at all to our analysis that um, your client's original rescission letter to the plaintiff only mentioned the failure to list the grandmother as the basis of rescission and not the suspended driver's license? Um, I don't believe so, uh, because ultimately the trial court's basis was separate. So we, we raised two issues below. One was a legal rescission that the 
court has to determine was there a material misrepresentation that go through the elements from Titan and um, determine whether it's equitable to apply the rescission. And the notice is really irre irrelevant to that issue. But our second issue that we raised was that there was a contractual rescission and um, that the, in that, with respect to that issue, the notice is, is relevant, uh, but I don't think it matters, you know, what the basis of the material misrepresentation in the notice was. The point is that USAU, USA Underwriters was informing Ms. Orr that they believe she made a material misrepresentation pursuant to the terms of their policy and that they were therefore rescinding it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The case is submitted. Thank you for appearing to answer our questions. Moving on to number 11, today's docket, Absalund Construction Company versus Myosha. It please the court, William Moore of Clark Hill, appearing on behalf of Asplund is uh, how we pronounce that, Asplund Construction Company. Okay. I'm Christopher Perlito, also appearing on Asplund. Yeah. Please proceed. This is an appeal from the Wayne County Circuit Court, which was in itself an appeal from the uh, Board of Health and Safety Compliance and Appeals uh, via a remand from the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, as you know, this case arose out of a tragic event which culminated in the unfortunate and fatal electrocution of Samuel Lurch on July 19, 2017. Mr. Lurch was one of approximately 4,000 employees of Asplund. He was a journeyman electrician with over 15 years on the job. Following a flawed investigation by Myosha, one citation with 10 separate subparts were issued, all characterized as serious violations, and except for one, all carried substantial penalties. Asplund appealed. There was a four-day hearing before Administrative Law Judge Stephen Goldstein. Uh, he issued an exhaustive 54-page opinion, which I'm sure you've read. He vacated nine of the 10 citations. Myosha filed exceptions to the Board of Health, requesting reinstatement of all nine. Basically, the administrative process effectively allows Myosha to uh, get another bite at the apple, and that's what they did in this case. On November 20, a hearing was held before the board. There was no witness testimony, no argument, no due process, uh, and without any critical analysis, really, uh, they disregarded the extensive evidence that was presented to the ALJ. They disregarded unrefuted hearing testimony and facts, disregarded most of the well-reasoned findings of the ALJ, and did reverse nine, eight of the nine that were remaining. It's our position that they basically acted in lockstep with the conclusions of Myosha, except on the one, and the final order upheld one citation against Asplund, which they did agree with the ALJ, so there was one violation there, and they dismissed one other citation, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, reinstating the remaining eight was timely appealed to the Wayne County Circuit Court. There was an oral argument and an opinion read from the bench. The court dismissed three more of those violations for lack of sufficient evidence in the record. And so this appeal only applies to the remaining five. The decision of the Circuit Court and the final order of the board should really be reversed on appeal for the following reasons. In review of the case, the board abdicated its statutory mandate and abused its authority. Secondly, the Wayne County Circuit Court failed to recognize and rule upon the mistakes made by the board and by Myosha. In short, the problems the court found with the three violations that it did vacate were the same issues and problems with the other five that, that the court left standing. X, clear evidence existed in the record of unpreventable employee misconduct. That is a defense to any Myosha violation and the conclusions of the board intentionally were inconsistent, internally inconsistent, and obviously 
arbitrary and capricious. And I'll, I mean, doesn't much of this, or at least, well, in my opinion, much of this boil down to the fact that the board really didn't make many, if at all, findings of fact. Conclusions of law, maybe you could say it did. But in terms of the findings of fact, when it disagreed with the ALJ, we have, I, I can't figure out why. It's, it's, That's it's the nearly impossible to figure out why the board rejected. And I think you accurately characterize a very well thought out, very well explained uh, opinion by the ALJ, which the board has every right to reject but it has to explain itself. And for the life of me, I can't figure out on these five why the board rejected it. That's correct. Okay. The procedure and the, the law requires that they do that. And there's two sections of the law that requires them to do that. We've cited both of those in our uh, brief. One is the Administrative Procedures Act that says a final decision shall include findings of fact and conclusions of law. I'll agree with you. There were a couple of conclusions, but there were no findings of fact. Uh, it was just... We don't find this, we don't find that. Um, and we would suggest that a board like a court has to speak through its orders and decisions. I mean, and you, you can keep arguing right now, or may I suggest you save some time for rebuttal because um, I think we'd like to hear from Myosha and then you'll have plenty of time for rebuttal. Well, let, let me make one point and then I'll do that. Um, it's interesting to note that the one violation that Myosha did overturn was a violation. It was number three, or I'm sorry, number one. And it was a violation that required the employer to give personal protection equipment to its employees that are gonna be in this position. We did that. All of that stuff was in the bucket. Mr. Lurch didn't use any of it. We don't know why. The board decided that the unpreventable employee misconduct did apply on that issue. And they vacated that decision. That's completely contrary to at least four of the five that are remaining, which relate to the same issue of PPE. So it, not only is it inconsistent, but it also creates um, a conclusion in our mind that it is arbitrary and capricious. Before you sit down, I, I don't want to be unfair to you because there is um, at least one issue that I might disagree with you on at the moment in terms of the ALJ. Um, I think at one point you make an argument that the board and even maybe the circuit court should have deferred to the ALJ, that there should be some, that there's some formal deference. And I don't, I, I'm not sure where you're getting that because the ALJ is almost as if, you know, kind of an analogous would be a magistrate judge in the federal system where they are making a report and recommendation. And do you have case law that says that a board must defer to the ALJ? There is case law in the brief, I believe on page, I'll, I'll get the page number uh, for you. It's in the yes, brief. It's you in the brief worry, you know, and uh, page 12. Okay. The point there is, yes, there is some deference. It's almost like uh, when you hear a case from the circuit court, you give deference to the trier of fact. That's what we have here. The, uh, the ALJ was the trier of fact, heard the opinions, heard the testimony, saw the facts, saw numerous exhibits, and made the decision based on that. So the Supreme Court does say, yes, you have to give that some uh, some notice and you have to give that some deference. The is it the same to... that you have to give to the board? Maybe not, but there is a level of deference that the board has to give and should give to an ALJ, the trier of fact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Morning. Kyle Beerlein uh, on behalf of Myosha. Um, Asplund has confused the procedures by which the board acts. It's misstated the authority uh, that the board is granted under the Myosha Act and misapplied the, the circuit court standard of review in this case uh, or through its appeal. Um, I, I just want to touch on a, a few different points uh, here this morning briefly. The, the board is solely authorized to make the final decision uh, regarding Myosha citations. An ALJ, administrative law judge, um, only offers non-final recommendations for the board to consider, but they're not required um, to, to offer deference to the ALJ's recommendation um, because the board is the one that was authorized by law to affirm, modify, or vacate um, those citations. 
Next, the, the circuit court in this case applied the correct legal principles uh, in, in determining that the board's decision was authorized by law and supported by competent material and substantial evidence. Um, it, through its appeal, Asplund is effectively arguing that the circuit court applied the correct legal principles in overturning several of the citations in favor of Asplund, but then applying incorrect legal principles in affirming several of the citations. But they offer no explanation or justification as to how or, or where the circuit court applied um, two different standards of review. And I, I think with respect to this this deference issue, it's interesting that they, they argued that the circuit court engaged in this blind reliance on the board's decision, but the, the circuit court overturned several of the citations uh, that the board had affirmed. So what about, is, what about at least one of my main concerns of we can't tell what the board did or why the board did what it did in terms of uh, these five citations that are, uh, are at issue in terms of there's just no findings of fact by the board. Sure. So uh, under the law, I, I believe that the, this decision does actually comply with what's required to be in there. They have findings of facts that are minimally, you know, listed. Uh, I understand what, what the court's saying. However, what I would want to make sure that's clear here is these individuals that are on the board are not lawyers. They're not judges. Um, these are individuals who have an expertise in workplace safety and the, the MIOSHA regulations. They issued these decisions with that expertise in mind, and they're basing their entire decision on the record um, that's available to them. It's not just limited to the ALJ's decision, and, and they have tried to, in this case specifically, articulate what the rule was that, that was at issue. They've articulated what the um, MIOSHA had, had, you know, offered up effectively as, as what they're relying on in, in that decision. I, Here, here's the problem though, from our perspective, is that the board might've been completely correct on these five citations, but we, don't, we have no basis for, for analyzing that because you have the ALJ who again, did a very nice, thorough, detailed opinion here, explaining why these five citations should be uh, overturned. And then you have the board who, you know, who are, like you said, um, and I accepted our experts, uh, they come in and just say, no. Again, they might be right, but, and even if they're not lawyers, they got to give us something. Sure. And I think that the decision is when they're including information about what Myosha had relied on in issuing those citations, that is their, their, what they're relying on in finding by the preponderance of the evidence, right? So they, they list what Myosha had asserted um in the citations and what was the basis for issuing these citations that is what they're relying on in these findings of fact and then they ind indicate in that decision as well that you know based on the preponderance of the evidence for, for those conclusions of law for each of these uh, these citations i, I understand that the, i think what the board did here might have been completely fine if it was simply affirming the alj because then you could go and say okay well the board seems to have agreed with the alj and the alj kind of spelled it out more but I think when you have a, a situation when the board pretty significantly disagrees with the ALJ, again, for, for us to do our appellate review, we, we need something. Sure. And I, I think that so when, that may be that may require the board to analyze more than what it normally would if it was simply going to affirm, for example. Uh, to that point, I, I think that when you actually look at the statute uh, and it's, uh, I believe, MCL uh, 408 1044 that specifically articulates what the board's authority here is, that statute doesn't indicate how, whether the board has to provide its reasoning why it disagrees with an ALJ's decision. And, and that goes to this, this deference issue that isn't afforded here. It only requires the ALJ or the board to, to make a determination in reviewing that decision. It does not go into um, explaining that, that basis um, for that. Um, the, the, the next point I, I think that I would like to also just discuss from appellant's, or appellant's brief is they have this assertion that because the safety rules are written in a way that require employees to take certain action or not take certain actions when they're performing the work that employers cannot be responsible under, under the regulations. And I think it's quite frankly, a remarkable assertion that they're taking in that reply brief. And Aspen's position is contrary to the basic understanding of workplace safety laws. Um, and it demonstrates at best that they don't understand my, my OSHA regulations. 
the, the MIOSHA safety standards apply to employers in this state. That, that's a very clear and well-established fact. And the employers are required to ensure that employees are, are complying with, with the safety rules. And they're also required to provide a, a workplace free of hazards that may result in physical harm, or in this case, death. Employees are never cited by MIOSHA. That, that is simply not how the law works. And employers are required um, to, are always going to be responsible if, if a citation is issued, unless they can demonstrate unpreventable employee misconduct, but the board and the circuit court, both in affirming these citations that we're here to discuss today, determined that wasn't applicable. Um, any other position on that issue would, would effectively disregard decades of federal and state workplace safety laws. Um, a couple points that were raised on, on Brother Council's um, argument today, MIOSHA cannot direct review on its own. It, that, that was a misstatement of, of fact and procedure here in this case. Both parties have the opportunity to file exceptions after an ALJ issues a report that's provided for under the administrative rules, and it's included in, even in this case, ALJ uh, Goldstein's uh, decision. Um, a member of the board is the one who has to actually direct review of that. They don't have to, but they can. And in this case, they did following MIOSHA um, issuing or filing their, their exceptions. Um, and again, the, the, the last point I would just make is the deference that, that is raised in these, these cases that are cited are related to Merck, the, the Employment Relations Commission decisions. They have a separate standard. They have a separate law governing what authority is granted to them than what the MIOSHA Board of Health and Safety Compliance is afforded. And in our case, they are the ones that are ultimately responsible for affirming, modifying, vacating these citations. And that's where that authority comes from. Um, so I, I believe that the, the record that was available to the circuit court um, and to the board is, is justifies the decisions that were made and the circuit court applied the correct legal principles in affirming the, the decision or affirming the, the citations that it did. No. Thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, your honors. The circuit court obviously gave half a loaf to, to the board. Did, I don't think they had to. I don't think, uh, I think he could have easily ruled as you're suggesting since there was no basis for the decision could have easily ruled in favor of the appellant on all items he decided to to cut the loaf for whatever reason uh, secondly the board is a statutory body it is required by statute to do a couple different things which we've talked about and the one statute it requires that they have findings of fact conclusions of law the apa mandates that a final decision have written findings of fact. Uh, there is one attorney on the board, and there was at that time, but uh, whether there is or not, these are experts in the field. They are supposed to know safety. And frankly, read the statute. I mean, there are there's a whole panoply of people that, that support that board. And they certainly have the right and the obligation to let the board know how they're supposed to do things. And they didn't follow it in this case. The board is supposed to decide these cases on the whole record, not just MIOSHA complaints and MIOSHA issues. And that's what they did in this case. Um, the clear actions of Mr. Lurch constituted an isolated yet fatal violation of regulations by an employee. The employer is not a guarantor of employee action, never has been and, and can't. Uh, how could we have stopped him? Very difficult. Uh, he's a journeyman electrician. He's going up. He has all the stuff. We can assume that he's going to put it on at some point. The problem is he had that wire in his hand. Nobody told him to take that up with him. There's no evidence from the a, uh, attorney general that anybody knew he was going to take that wire with him. And the experts described that it was the wire didn't that caused the him the electrician. From, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, no. Um, didn't, didn't, wasn't he um, handed the wire from an employee? He was, An he instructed or... the apprentice to give him the wire. Yes. The apprentice who's new on the job didn't know any better. The supervisor wasn't there at the time. Frankly, had he asked the supervisor, he would have told no, there's no reason for him to go up and there was no reason for him to take the wire. And the experts, the safety experts clearly testified that had he not had that wire, nothing would have happened. The buckets insulated, even if he didn't use the other stuff that he had, the gloves, the sleeves, everything else, he would not have been electrocuted. The problem is he had the wire. Nobody knows why. Now, Attorney General cites or states that uh, just because the citation and the authority for the citation says the employee must do this, that the employer is still responsible. There's no statutory case law for that. There's no precedent for that. 
if you read the clear language, and we can do that, but it's cited in the briefs, the employee shall, the employee shall. There's four of those citations, three or four, that say the employee shall do it. The one that said the employer shall provide PPE is the one that they dismissed. So I don't know how they can argue that uh, that those clearly apply to the employer when the one that did clearly apply to the employer is the one that was dismissed by the board. So when you look at the totality of the circumstances, look at the full record, uh, the there's a couple of great findings of fact of the ALJ, I'm not going to read them, it's 16, 17, and 18, and it's on pages 33 and 34. It kind of puts it all in a nutshell. And if the board was going to defer or, or disagree with those, tell us why. We probably wouldn't be here today if they told us why. The problem is they couldn't tell us why. They didn't tell us why. There's no evidence to suggest that this was anything other than employee misconduct. And may he rest in peace. We don't know why he did it, but he did. And he put himself in harm's way through no fault of the employer. Thank you. No. Thank you very Thank much. You. Case is submitted. Following the 12th matter on our docket, docket number 362748, Carbonen v. Charles R. Green, PA. Is Mr. Becker here today? Is that Mr. Cook? Do you know Mr. Becker? I mean, have you? Okay. But he, this is the, that is the attorney who's on the other side, correct? Okay. I don't see anything on here about um, doing it remotely or waiving. Have we heard from? If you wouldn't mind, Mr. Cook. While well, we have to let the ambulance go by anyway, so. <laughs> I mean, if you want to, we can. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Becker? Yes. Sorry uh, about that. I had a Zoom hearing that uh, they adjourned for me, and I just had to confirm it. No problem. We had somebody that was being obstreperous. Well, wait a minute. Sorry about that. Becker, sign on. <laughs> That's Judge Heisey. Sorry, Judge. Well, I think the main thing I can give you in this case is uh, perspective on what's causation. Can you put your name on the record, please? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Frank G. Becker, P25502, appearing on behalf of appellant. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed. So this is a trend that's going on in this area is looking at causation in a strange way, because we have doctors and because doctors use special terminology, somehow there's some belief that because they use special words, that causation is totally different than in a different area. For instance, let's say we had the smartest people in the world and there was such a gathering when Einstein was there uh, and the developer of uh, quantum physics, and they're all together in one room. But if there was an explosion in that room, do we say, oh, look, these guys are really smart. We have to understand what the mechanics of this 
explosion were. You know, this person was sitting right there and he didn't die for three months. This guy died right away. This guy lingered on. What we have here is a simple case. Cancer is bad. Cancer should be treated as soon as possible. Whoever sees a person in the medical field, whether he's a physician assistant or a doctor, knows that. We know that. Everybody knows that. But in this case, they're saying, well, he doesn't know the doubling effect of the carcinoma. He doesn't know the exact date that it entered the eye. Well, who does? He doesn't treat this. This naturally falls. Don't lose our common sense. Don't say all we have to do is have a doctor. And the doctor can say this naturally arises from the cancer. This is a physician assistant. And under our laws, you know, a few months before this happened, Michigan changed the statute, MCL 333.17047, and they made it more consistent. You know, we have a tremendous shortage. It was just saw an article last night in Crane's Detroit Business. Michigan has an acute shortage of family doctors. So what's happening? Well, let's take somebody that knows what they're doing. Let's have nurse practitioners, more nurse practitioners. They can give me a shot. They can do this and they can do that. Let's have physician's assistants. Let's have them do more. It's better than nothing, of course. But if you go to a physician assistant and he sees cancer, and then there's some talk, well, I'm going to go to Florida. I mean, there was no indication that, you know, it, it might be cancer, but no, no one ever said, you need treatment. It's cancer. What is cancer? It kills cells. You know, whatever treatment you have and more and more are being developed, you know, you, you, if you get chemo, whatever, you, you know, it's going to kill all the cells. They have it specialized. Now they're, now they're getting into cells that actually look for the cancer cell, try to become a cancer cell, and try to eat the cancer cells. Instead, we get this gobbledygook. And it's all it is, is an attempt to confuse. I mean... Why would you have to know when, when it happens, how long it happens? Look at what happened with nuclear tragedies. When you have nuclear- I don't, I don't get the point of, you know, that it, that is, are, are you suggesting it's irrelevant? What I'm how, no. Excuse me. Whether it's irrelevant, whether this uh, cancer, these cancer cells, the rate of doubling, that that's an irrelevant piece of information. We just, we know cancer is bad, cancer kills, and that's, that's sufficient. It's for the finer effect, Your Honor. If you think that's such a great thing, argue it. We're not saying they can't argue it. We're not saying they can't bring opposing points of view, but I'm saying that it's with in the natural, more likely than not scenario, that if you delay treatment, and what do they do? They do the same thing that they're claiming that we do. They're saying, oh, he shouldn't have gone to Florida. He ignored the suggestion. He knew that there was a problem. Oh, he should have gone to University of Michigan Hospital sooner. Everything is all mixed up. That's the way medicine is. And under our statute, if you can, if you can diagnose and treat, you can give a prognosis. It's all part of it. When you go to a doctor, you don't want to say, well, this is your medical condition, but I can't tell you that you're going to die in two weeks. I can't tell you that because I'm not qualified. That's ludicrous. If they're giving us the right to see these people and relying on them and they're becoming part of our medical treatment, they can testify as to all aspects, just like they can treat all aspects. And the fact that in Pennsylvania, he he's under supervision doesn't really mean anything because when you look at what supervision means, all it means is that at the end of the day, a doctor signs the notes. Supervision does not require 
that you be there overlooking. Obviously, it does not, or there'd be no need for it. There would be no need for a physician assistant if you're going to be right there. Oh, what should I do here? Should I give this? Oh, how should I hit his knee? How should I uh, check his temperature? It's not like that. All they do is give the notes at the end of the day. And what our, we were very much taken aback by the position of the lower court, as you might imagine, because the lower court indicated, oh, you need to know all this. You have to treat. And that's not the way it is. All this is really, and it wasn't like this before. It wasn't like this before. But when first it was all attacks on the qualifications, oh, you know, you're from uh, New Jersey. You can't testify as to a small it town. It seemed to be strained. I mean, let's just focus on this case and the question of causation. And I mean, I don't, I don't want to relitigate battles from 20 years ago. Let's just focus on the state of the law today and whether you have enough facts here for causation. Yes, because we have a physician assistant and that's who we're dealing with. So we have to have a physician assistant. And this physician assistant said that it was more likely than not. He said actually more than that, but at least that's all the st standard is. His testimony will be helpful. In terms of cause and fact, the jury can use their own common sense. But he said in his position, he believes it was more likely than not, and he was totally candid in terms of what he knew, what he didn't know, what he did, but he remained steadfast. And we think he makes a great witness. And, it's, and all we're saying is that his testimony should be allowed, in this case should go. And I just wanted to give you that perspective because I think that's what we're really talking about here. Okay, I think we understand. Um, you'll have time for a brief rebuttal. Thank you. Let's hear from the other side. May it please the court, Michael Cook on behalf of defendants, FLEs, Charles Green and Up North Dermatology. Morning. Morning. Uh, the primary or main issue here is the trial court's evidentiary ruling concerning the plaintiff's experts uh, causation testimony, the admissibility of it, reliability. This court reviews that determination for an abuse of discretion. Uh, so while it is a summary disposition ruling ultimately, I don't think there's any real dispute that if you affirm the abuse of discretion ruling that that testimony is inadmissible, then summary dis disposition follows because there is no testimony to establish causation. In terms of the trial court's ruling on reliability, <clears throat> this is not an issue without basis. Mm -hmm. The plaintiff had this lesion start growing over the entire summer of 2017. He didn't see my client until well into fall of 2017. And the trial court captured the causation issue that was at the heart of this beautifully, I thought. He, he said on page 17 of his opinion, if the eye had been already involved upon the initial presentation, no delay in diagnosis, which is the claim here, could have affected plaintiff's outcome because the same procedure still would have been ultimately necessary. So that's what this comes down to. Can they establish a question of fact through their expert on was the eye involved at this point? And the trial court went through um, and gave loads of latitude to the plaintiff to establish this. If you look at the original briefing on it, as the proponent of the expert, the plaintiff has the burden to show reliability, to establish the factors that support reliability. What about, Mr. what about Mr. Becker's point that the rate of doubling, uh, you know, how aggressive this cancer was, how deep it was uh, when first identified, those are all, um, a jury might find those interesting, but that he doesn't need those to survive, to, to establish at least a genuine issue material fact with regard to causation. So he, he absolutely needs that. Okay. And, and, it's, and it's captured in what the, the, how the trial court articulated the causation theory. Because if the eye was already involved when they first saw him, if the rate of doubling over the summer, over the, into the fall, had already reached the eye, and the scope of this procedure, regardless of it had been done October 26, would have been the same. They would have had to do the same thing, or they would, there's a lot of discussion about the Mohs surgical technique. 
if a Mohs surgeon on that date would have looked at it and said, I can't do a Mohs procedure. This is too large at this point. It's in a very thin area of, of where the skin is and invades the bone. I'm not going to be able to do this procedure. Then there's no causation. There's no question of fact. And that's what their expert couldn't testify to because he's not a Mohs surgeon. He, do, he admitted he, if he had seen this patient, he would have referred him out. He couldn't treat it. So it's not enough just to show that, and I'm either October, November, I forget which specific one it was. It was size of X. And then in March or April, when uh, he came back from Florida, right. it was the size of, you know, 3X. Right. The, um, that Those, the two different uh, uh, sizes is not enough to send this to the jury. No, because they, they need to establish that the procedure would have been different had been done in October. And that's what they can't establish. That's what their expert wasn't qualified to establish without his testimony. They have no expert testimony in a medical malpractice case. You do need expert testimony for this exact reason, because lay jurors can't sit there and say, this is how you treat that in October, right? You can treat it with this, that, this procedure. They don't know that they need an expert to come in and explain to them, this is how it could have been treated. And when that, they don't have an expert say it would have been different than what it was ultimately when they did the procedure, they can't establish causation. Uh, so again, I, I think the trial court gave them every grace in terms of their briefing initially, still had a Daubert hearing despite the deficiencies there. The trial court pointed out they didn't even go through the 2955 factors in the testimony that they presented and argued at that hearing. That it, again, they are the proponent. When you look at 2955, it starts as a rule of exclusion. It says, this testimony is not admissible unless the trial court finds reliability. So they had the obligation to show the trial court that this was reliable, and they just didn't go through it. And the trial court went through more than the plaintiffs did, truthfully, uh, and came to the conclusion that they have not established reliability under abuse of discretion. The trial court did not abuse its discretion. We're asking this court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Just briefly, Your Honor. Hold on. I think we have... Oh, Good morning, Sandra Lake on behalf of Ape Apelli Boyne Country. I concurred in the motion in the trial court. Um, I concur in Mr. Cook's comments here today. I don't have anything to add to them. I'll rely on my brief. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Becker. Yes, thank you. So there's, there's one case that they have in their brief, and I can't remember which one it was because, uh, but there's a case that says you don't need absolute truth. Now, who's right and who's wrong? So their expert says, we don't know. But obviously, the delay very well could have been a big factor because normally it is a big factor. And that's our common sense. And that's what's generally accepted. And that's what somebody that's on the ground floor doing this every day believes that you got to get treatment right away, even though he doesn't do the most surgery. So they don't, they, they don't have the standard of absolute truth. All they have different than our guy is he's using different jargon, like doubling rate. But who's going to say what the ultimate absolute truth is? You know, he gets his $10,000 check or whatever he gets. He writes his report. Oh, yes, this is the causation. Uh, you can't tell causation. We have no idea, you know, so we have no idea. So let's just forget about this guy. He doesn't have a right to come in here because, and once again, he resorted, he went to Florida. He, he didn't get his most uh, procedure at University of Michigan. So what I'm saying is that let them have their jargon, let them have their words, but let us have reality here and let us have an actual physician assistant who we are counting on now because we don't have enough doctors. Let him speak, let him speak, let him testify. If the jury says it's all hogwash, you know, uh, you know, we don't care. He lost his eye. You know, that's your own fault. Whatever happens, happens. We don't know what the jury is going to do, but don't bar him because the judge got
got confused and thought that the expert had to know all this stuff when they don't. It's ridiculous. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for your consideration. We appreciate your time. Uh, it's a sad, interesting case, um, and we'll try to get an opinion out in the next uh, few weeks. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That case is submitted. Turning to the 13th matter for our case call, docket number 367197, In Ray, sorry, In Ray Keenan Minor. Morning. Good morning, uh, Timothy Pinto from University of Michigan Child Welfare Appellate Clinic on behalf of uh, the parent appellant here. Uh, Your Honor, we're, we're raising two procedural mistakes that were that took place um, at the, at, well, before the trial and at the trial. Um, the first is um, the finding, well, there were no reasonable efforts made here. And so as we lay out in our brief, when you don't make reasonable efforts, it, it creates a flaw in the ultimate findings that there are, that there are grounds for termination. Um, I don't think that the record can be read in any way to suggest that reasonable efforts were made. At trial, the worker admitted she were provided- Were reasonable efforts required? Uh, well, so that's the second part. So the, I think that their only possible excuse that DHHS can make is- Yeah, let's look at this. Okay. Because right. I think the second part, and you know, uh, Judge Garrett will have uh, her own views, her own questions. For me, the second part kind of drives this case. Yes. So let's let's take a look at that. Were uh, reasonable efforts statutorily required here? So our position is that they that you start with a premise that they are required, and if you want to skip them, you have to make a judicial determination, and that's what never happened here. That's, I'm sorry, were you going <laughs> to? That's an interesting phrase you use, judicial determination, only because. As I'm looking at uh, MCL 712A.19A2, .19A and then it has subparts A, B, and C. So A says you have to have, there is a judicial determination that the parent has been subject, yada, yada, yada. B, something else. C, the parent has had the rights to the child siblings involuntarily terminated and the parent has failed to rectify the conditions that led to that termination of parental rights. It doesn't say that there has to be a judicial termination. Uh, yeah, I've had this conversation with a number of people. We, okay. we have always read it and we we have always read it to be that the judicial determination uh, applies to all three. I, I, oh, I, how do you, I, I agree that you've had this debate. it only appears in A. Yeah. Um, so if we were just talking about C, the parents had the rights terminated and the parent has failed to rectify. I, I guess I would make the argument that we are still in a space where the court has to actually enunciate, we are skipping the obligation to make reasonable efforts. You have to actually tell the proponents that this is true because there are some evidentiary pieces to this. It's not, it's not simply either true or false and nobody needs to speak about it. Well, the, first, the first part of, of C would not require any evidentiary. It's whether the rights have been, whether the parent has had rights to the child siblings involuntarily terminated. I, I, that should be I, that one's clearly established in this case, but I can imagine a situation in which nobody mentions it. And the, and so even that little piece, you do need to have okay. some evidence, but I agree it's it's clearly established here. The next part, though, you have to actually determine what led to those previous terminations and have those situations been rectified. I don't know how that can be satisfied without at least an enunciation to the parties that that's the situation. And let's assume you're correct, because I do. With B, I think it's pretty clear that you don't necessarily need a judicial determination because if the parent's been convicted, you should be able to look at the court record from that prior case. And that's that's something that we can take judicial notice of. C, it, it's hard to figure out how you find C if someone, if some judge hasn't found C. But that, so so I think that's an interesting discussion. But you're applying. You're, you're, we're looking at this under plain error, correct? And you have to then show not just error, 
but that there was a that a substantial right was was uh, uh, affected here. And my concern is that the record, I think, makes quite clear what C, you know, the, the reasons why the prior terminations occurred. And I think the record also makes quite clear that those conditions had not been rectified. Um, the, the parent here just suffered from substantial mental uh, illnesses, uh, drug abuse, um, and, and that was that's evident from the record. So if, if your honor has already made up your mind oh. on that, I, I Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, kind of to follow up. There's like 15 questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. That embedded in I, here. I, 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 I can't answer 15 said, in a row. But I, you know, um, why isn't the finding by the trial court of statutory grounds under 3I uh, sufficient to conclude that there was a determination that reasonable efforts were not required based on the prior sibling termination, especially since the statutory ground standard is more demanding than the reasonable efforts language. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, and that's certainly the argument that DHS is making on their brief is that it, it all got fixed at the end. And our core concern here is that the order is out of whack. So we start with the idea that not making reasonable efforts is a massive determination in a, in a case like this. It's a determination that we will have no chance, the parent will have no chance to prove ability to parent. And I think on your side, you have, I think it was Judge Connors. I mean, he, he routinely checked the box that reasonable efforts were being made. So Correct. there, there is confusion in this record. Yes. No doubt. Yes. And I, I, and I don't mean to suggest that if we were judging after knowing everything three years into the case, if we were making a determination, do aggravated circumstances exist or not? We lay out in our brief why we don't think they are, but I, I understand that that it could be proven if you were using three years. But the, the order is is crucially important here because it's such a big decision. And by the way, trial courts, we, laid, we mentioned in our brief, we would like a published decision here because trial courts are clearly confused about when they have the ability to just skip reasonable efforts. I was here a month ago. Uh, I wrote it down because I thought it might be helpful. Um, in Ray Slack. Uh, Court of Appeals 367199 in front of Judges Patel, Rick, and Feeney. We had the same exact issue. They skipped judicial determination. They didn't provide reasonable efforts. It fundamentally changes the case, and we need guidance to the courts about, hey, there, there's a statute that says you are allowed to skip reasonable efforts, but there you have to actually explain why you're doing it, and you need to alert the parties. I, my position would be just as a due process matter. You need to alert the parties. We're making this very big shift in the way this case is gonna move forward, we want to alert you so that if you don't think that we are right, either conditions have been rectified or um, you know, actually the claim that there's this conviction is not true, that needs to be laid out. Well, and I don't think, you know, cause it is interesting with, when you look at the record and I, and I wanna make clear that I'm, that I'm not suggesting that the trial court, there were two judges on this, they were just stuck with a very difficult situation. For sure. between COVID and just, you know, this person's unfortunate circumstances. It was just difficult. I mean, reading through this, just a difficult case to handle. Um, but I want to make, I, I want to clarify in my own mind, simply because we see that reasonable efforts were at least for a time ordered or suggested that things were happening or that things should have been happening. That alone isn't determinative, right? Because this provision 712a.19a says when reasonable efforts are not required but even in one of these circumstances where they're not required i don't know of anything that suggests that a trial court can't still order them because maybe it's a good idea especially under c i i 100 agree with okay what you're saying there there's so, nothing barring them from providing some efforts or but the, the the way that these boxes kept getting checked for two two years suggests true confusion by the court about whether they had made the decision reasonable efforts were or were not required. And there was no actual indication in the record that they were moving ahead to saying that they're aggravated circumstances. Getting back to Judge Garrett's question, and I want to make sure you have an opportunity to fully explore this, acknowledging that this determination ideally could have been done earlier, um, it was there was a statutory ground found by clear and convincing that is actually harder than or a higher bar 
than what the reasonable efforts uh, provision here would, would show. So why didn't that essentially fix whatever mistakes may have been made prior? And so number one, as we say in our brief, we're, we're not accepting that they did provide clear and convincing evidence, but even if I, I get that. But I, even if I step into that space and say, uh, three years later is too late given the impact on this case. And the reasonable efforts actually has a real impact on cases because it is the opportunity for parents to prove that they will have that forward looking, that future ability to parent. And so if you wait three years now, it's possible you could have a case where you're moving right to termination and it all happens quickly and there's no reasonable efforts in the, the two months intervening the initial hearing and the, the trial. I, I can imagine in that situation saying um, we have solved it, but I don't think it is fair in a case like this where it's been three years to say that you can fix it later. Due process wise, I think that's a failure. What about... What about the, I think, very fair argument that most of the delay here was a result of your client uh, and COVID, and the fact that, and I don't mean, I don't mean necessarily that your client was trying to delay, but she was in Kent County for a, for almost all of this, uh, Kent County Jail. Um, there were times where it was clear that you know, a trial was getting ready to go and she backed out and said, you know, she couldn't handle it, uh, uh, given some mental uh, issues she was going through. Um, you know, it's her right to have a jury trial, but jury trials couldn't occur for a long time. Everything got backed up. The, at one point, you know, she kind of went back and she wavered between bench trial versus jury trial. So this would typically, are, is, this, is this kind of a finding often found during the adjudication stage. And it's just the fact that the adjudication took three, you know, it didn't happen for three years. It, it definitely is. And some, and by the way, this might have been a case, well, it would have been a case where they did termination at the initial disposition. So it all would have happened much earlier. Um, I, I, I wanna gently push back on the claim that it's her fault when all she was doing is saying, I want a jury trial. And, I wanna say it's her fault. Yeah, and okay. I hope I didn't say that. Uh, okay. it's, I may she, she was involved in many of the decisions that resulted in delay. Yeah, th th that's certainly true. I just, it's a terrible case. Um, and I'm, I'm very worried about the procedural stance here. It, it Waiting three years without providing reasonable efforts and then terminating and holding that against her. I, I, I think it was handled incorrectly. And I do think trial courts really need to understand how significant that decision is to decide they're not going to proceed with reasonable efforts. And there, there's mechanisms to do that. Um, putting aside reasonable efforts, why wasn't there sufficient evidence to support termination under 3H, particularly when the mother would not have been released from prison for at least another 13 months at the time of the termination hearing? So, so 3-H has the forward-looking component to it. And, and this builds right back into our reasonable efforts argument, which is, so our position is, if you have to provide reasonable efforts and you don't provide reasonable efforts, you, you are, a trial court simply cannot make a determination about a parent's future ability to parent. Because uh, Rude uses the phrase hole in the record. You have to provide the opportunity, you have to actually test the premise that the, the that the parent will never be able to provide proper care. And the way you do that under our statutory scheme is to provide reasonable efforts, give them services and see if they're making any signs of improvement. And you know, let's not ignore the elephant in the room in terms of reasonable efforts. And she was in jail for yes. at least the, ver the vast majority of this. I think maybe at one point she was in um, uh, some other institution, but I mean, she was in Kent County Jail or Washtenaw County Jail, from what I can tell, most of this time. Um, what reasonable efforts were were practically available to her um, while she's in jail? It's definitively true that you that it may be impossible for DHHS to provide services to someone in jail that they would provide to someone who's not in jail. Uh, Mason says you have an obligation to do what you can, so you have to actually the the obligation doesn't disappear. Um, in this case, 
the one claim that DHHS is making is that while we did do a mental health referral and the record indicates, this is in uh, 43A to 45A in our appendix, the worker says, I've contacted the jail about mental health services or some sort of services that they can offer mom within the jail. And they stated that they can, that they do have services in place. And they gave me a number to place that referral. And then she, uh, the worker says, and that number was like a dial tone. It wasn't a real number. So we're working on that and that's it. There's nothing else in the record that they ever followed up. Made, so there, there was at least one thing possible, may not be everything, but there was one thing possible. And even that they didn't do. Do we also, again, consider, because I think this, this case would be in a much different posture if these arguments were raised below. You know, I mean, that's, Absol that's Absolutely. and I know your, your clinic didn't get involved until. And we, and we didn't raise an ineffective assistance of counsel. And so you're, you're right, the, the, the standard here on review is, is stricter because of that, yes. So given the fact that we do look at this through plain error, um, do we consider the fact that with her prior children, she was, at least there's record evidence that she was provided um, quite a significant amount of services and they don't seem to have helped. Does that factor into our calculus at all? I don't- Under plain error? Yeah, um, I think my best answer is that I don't think it should because I think that is baked into why you don't have to do reasonable efforts in cases with previous terminations if it hasn't been rectified. So it's been baked into the statute. If you've already done gone through this and you have failed, then maybe DHS doesn't need to provide those reasonable efforts this time. But if you, short of that finding, then I think you still, it says in all cases. Yeah, I, and I want to make clear. I think at one point you suggested, well, if you've already found this is this is one of the stranger termination cases I've ever seen, and I, I think I can assure you, at least my mind is uh, nowhere near made up on this because it is it's got so many moving parts, and it's just it's, it's a unique case. So um, yes, I agree. <laughs> do you have any more questions right now? We appreciate Thank you. your, and we would appreciate your clinic's involvement. Thank you. Um, I don't know that all these issues would have gotten fleshed out the way they did if you hadn't been involved. So um, you will have great, great. some time for Thank you. rebuttal. And I'll just say, um, I had two students work on this brief and they did oh. the writing. And so I'm very, I will definitely be reporting back. Yes. You said great brief. Yes, I I'm agree. guessing they're watching us right they now. Are, and, they are, uh, in, they are embroiled in uh, finals the last, oh, yes, so, oh, yes, so yeah. that's why they're not here. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Good morning, your honors. Uh, Ellie Sabat, Washtenaw County Prosecuting Attorney on behalf of MDHHS. Uh, I do wanna spend uh, hopefully the bulk of my time answering any questions uh, this panel has, uh, I do briefly want to just address two points, one pertaining to the standard of review here and, and second, moving into the aggravated circumstance termination, which I, I do agree is dispositive of the uh, reasonable efforts issues in this case. Uh, now, as to the standard of review, we are, of course, here on plain error review. Uh, appellant was represented by counsel throughout these proceedings, yet at no point uh, during, you know, the 24 hearings in this case, was it ever suggested that uh, reasonable efforts were not be made? Was there ever, ever any objection to the services she was receiving? At no point did appellant or counsel suggest that a formal aggravated circumstance determination needed to be made. Uh, and the same is true after she accepted the, uh, uh, she, she decided to move to bench trial and the court accepted that. At no point uh, did appellant or her counsel suggest that uh, their decision to accept that choice uh, was in any way improper. Now, of course, that, that puts us here on plain error review, uh, but I also just want to emphasize that uh, many of the arguments that my friend on the other side makes would seek to break uh, new jurisprudential ground. Uh, for example, in the reply brief, uh, you know, appellant says uh, really for the first time that though an aggravated circumstance determination may in a normal case be made at the initial dispositional hearing, which is what happened here through the termination finding, uh, that the court is under some sort of a time clock. And if the proceedings take too long, then uh, at that point, the trial court can no longer make uh, an aggravated circumstance finding at the initial dispositional hearing. Uh, that, that cuts against what this court 
has said in its published decision in Rippey, as well as in Henry Scott, Reina Rojas Salinas, all of which were cited in our brief, it, it is an argument that would break new jurisprudential ground. The same is true with the argument with respect to the withdrawal of the uh, jury demand in which, you know, appellant seeks to import the court rules applicable to pleas into the jury uh, demand withdrawal context. Now, given that we're on plain error review uh, and given that the trial court did everything according to this court's previous guidance, the statutes and the court rules, we do think there was no error at all. But in particular, there can't be plain error because plain error, of course, requires an error that was clear and obvious. And when the trial court does everything according to this court's previous guidance, the statutes and the court rules, but fails to anticipate, I guess, sua sponte, sort of a, a novel theory that might be raised on appeal, I don't see how the error could be uh, clear and obvious. Uh, with, with that background, I do want to move into the aggravated circumstance determination, uh, which again, I think is, I mean, it's dispositive of the question of whether reasonable efforts were made because it excuses any reasonable reunification efforts by MBHHS. Uh, again, this court has made clear uh, in its published decision in Rippey, as well as the other cases I cited, that termination findings, factual findings that uh, underlie a termination finding, satisfy an aggravated circumstance uh, determination. And uh, Your Honor, Judge Sorzel, as, as you pointed out, the statute simply says that reasonable unification efforts are not required if any of the following apply, uh, right? So there's no requirement that there be some formal determination when you're under a 2C here. I mean, it's, it's interesting because under 2B, I get the fact that a judicial determination doesn't need to be made if there's a prior conviction. Mm -hmm. But uh, as opposing counsel pointed out, there does seem to be at least some question with regard to the latter part of C that might require, it just, it's an odd situation to say, well, we don't need a judicial determination, but don't we? Certainly, Your Honor. And and I wouldn't suggest that, you know, the, the trial court can just do nothing if it's proceeding under 2C. That's not, of course, what happened here. It made termination findings under uh, 19B3I, which precisely mirror and indeed is a bit more of a demanding standard than what's required for an aggravated circumstance determination under uh, 19A2A, uh, A2C. Uh, so, you know, because it made those findings for termination, including that second prong that she failed to rectify the conditions that had led to the previous determinations, that determination that necessarily satisfies the aggravated circumstance listed in uh, 19A to C. But what about opposing counsel's argument to that, which says that it's really the timing that distinguishes the aggravated uh, circumstances finding that should have been made versus the statutory ground that was made that really you can't just collapse them into one finding. One had to be done closer to the outset of the case. Yeah, and and of course I I'll start by saying that this case is unusual given how long it it took. Um, there were a number of you know confounding circumstances uh, here, including COVID, including difficulties uh, getting appellant to the Washtenaw County Court um, and her desire for a jury trial throughout most of the proceedings. So this I is think it's important to also point out if I if I remember right, there were several times where she said she wanted to wrap up her criminal proceedings. Correct. First. Correct. So she she actively wanted to delay this because she wanted to and maybe made total sense to her. To, to wrap up the criminal proceedings. That's all correct. And, and you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, she had a couple of mental health breaks. The trial court wanted her to be able to participate and so further adjourn proceedings so that she could get better. Um, so to your, to your question about timing, a, a couple of points. One, one is I, I will note that this precise argument that uh, trial court is under some sort of a time clock to make in aggravated circumstance determination was raised for the first time in the reply brief. It is an argument, you know, that this court generally wouldn't consider for that reason. That said, if this court is inclined to consider it, the termination case, I think we're usually a little less rigid with our rules on that. Fair, fair enough, fair enough, Your Honor. Um, but uh, you know, you can look at the statute, and the statute does not contain 
any time requirements whatsoever. It just says if any of the following apply. And if you look at this court's decision, uh, which we cite on page 16 in our brief in Reina Rojas Salinas, uh, this court said that the statute does not provide any requirements for how or when an aggravated circumstance determination must be made. It merely requires that a determination be made and you know, went on as in Scott, as in Rippey, to hold that factual findings made at the termination hearing satisfy aggravated circumstance. So again, particularly on plain error review, uh, I don't see how the trial court could be faulted um, for following this court's guidance, which does not impose any uh, sort of time restrictions on when an aggravated circumstance uh, determination or finding sufficient to satisfy that determination uh, must be made. Um, you know, you know, finally, on that point, uh, I agree, of course, with uh, my friend on the other side that this case has taken a long time. Um, I, I do not agree that uh, the outcome of that should be to preclude the trial court from doing what it would normally do, which is making uh, a finding sufficient to satisfy aggravated circumstances at the initial dispositional hearing, delayed though it might be. Uh, the argument there eff effectively is that if this case has taken too long, then we need to make it go on longer. Uh, there is a little boy on the other side of this, uh, you know, who by all accounts is thriving with his foster mom, who is bonded to his foster mom. She wishes to adopt him. Uh, the only thing standing in the way here is uh, the dependency of this litigation. And as the trial court concluded in making the termination finding, uh, the time has now come to give this little boy some stability. We agree with that. And for that reason, uh, along with the others given in our brief, if there's no further questions, we would ask that this court affirm. Yeah, I think you kind of answered my question. I just really wanted to know, you know, if it mattered that the trial court issue orders for nearly two years after the preliminary hearing requiring that reasonable efforts must be made um, even if they should not have been required you know does it does do you think that that matters I, I, I don't your honor uh, I don't think there's anything precluding a uh, trial court from saying you know services should be provided even if they're not ultimately going to be required uh, to do so 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 I don't think that that ultimately bears on whether an aggravated circumstance was properly found uh, later on I mean it, you know you can read that with the trial court going uh, above and beyond what it was um, you know, supposed to be doing in terms of ordering services, as well as potentially keeping its option open because the termination finding uh, under 19B3I was of course made uh, after the court, you know, received as evidence certified copies of the termination order and heard testimony from uh, MDHHS workers who, you know, articulated a little bit more about what had gone on in those previous uh, termination cases. So, uh, so the short answer is, is no, Your Honor, for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal. Um, I was reading the room that there wasn't a lot that you weren't as interested in the jury waiver issue. So I didn't address it at all. Um, it came up briefly with opposing counsel. Um, I just, I, the main thing I would point out is there was a GAL appointed to this mother. And then when she finally was waiving a relatively important right, nobody ever checked with the GAL to make sure that they were comfortable that she was making a knowing and voluntary waiver. Um, on the reasonable efforts, the, the last things, I, I, I won't repeat myself. I'll just, I'll just point out that I don't think there's any cost to making the reasonable efforts. We have a statutory scheme that says, we wanna make sure that we were making efforts to reunify um, in all cases, unless there's a, there, there are some, ex, you know, these aggravated circumstances are, we think it would be futile to do that, um, but, the case really, really changes as soon as you make that decision. We're almost on a, a train track to termination. And so the cost to making sure we do it right is low. The, the cost to doing it wrong is relatively extreme. And it's not just this case. As I said, this is happening over and over again. I think trial courts need some clarity and some guidance about the appropriate way to do it. If you're going to cut off reasonable efforts, you have to do it in a clear way for the parent. 
what is, do you happen to know your client's current incarceration status? The, the last I heard, she's supposed to be um, released sometime in 2024 was the last information I had. I thought I saw something in the regular like August of 2024. But, but I, don't, I don't know if that's true. That was the last thing in the record about it. Um, and so I don't know if that's true. Um, and, you know, I think the legal issues that the two, that the parties are arguing over are very interesting just as an intellectual exercise. Um, as a practical matter, if we do agree with you, you know, it, it's been, it's been suggest, or I mean, the record shows that the child has been away from your client for going on about three and a half years, I think now. Um, there was, there was some time right when he was born, maybe a day or two, but since then, the child has been in foster care with, I think, the same person. Um, as a practical matter, what what reasonable efforts can you envision that would actually work? I, I think that's an incredibly difficult question. And the, and the answer may be, well, I'm guessing if it were remanded, the first thing that would happen is they would actually make a proper determination. They would go through the mechanism of trying to decide whether there are aggravated circumstances here and no reasonable efforts were necessary. If they tried to make reasonable efforts, it has to be through the lens of re reasonable builds in this idea of what is the circumstance now for this child and this parent. It may be a, a huge uphill battle. Procedurally though, when we're talking about such a serious consequence, termination of parental rights, I think we have to do it correctly. Well, and this, you know, it's probably a question better posed to DHHS and circuit court judges who are expert in this rather than us. Certainly, and, and, and by the way, I don't want to ignore the fact that when circumstances change, I, I've been involved in too many cases where when everyone gets back down to the trial court level, they realize there's something short of termination that might, I'm not saying that's this case. I'm just saying it's possible that everyone realizes maybe she's okay with with adoption, I, I don't, I don't know what might happen. There's a guardianship. There, there may be other alternatives, but procedurally, it's such a serious consequence to cut off all contact that we need to make sure it's done correctly. Okay. Um, I do want to say, I, I very much, and I think I speak for the panel to say that we very much appreciate the clinic's involvement, and then to see an elected prosecutor come in and argue on a case like this. I've never seen. Uh, a county prosecutor come in and argue and on, on a termination case and you should be applauded for taking this these are important cases and um, we really appreciate it because the briefs were top-notch and the arguments today were top-notch yes. oh, thank you so much thank for your you time thank you so much yeah all right that case i'm sorry oh, no. more questions? No. okay that case thank is submitted you. we have two more that are going to be submitted on the record or on the briefs uh, number 14, docket number 367436, in Ray DeMille Minor. That case is submitted on the briefs. Number 15, docket number 367718, in Ray King Simmons Smith Minors. That case is also submitted on the briefs. That ends our case call.